Hi, so this presentation is going to cover epic conventions. Um, this is specific to World Lit. You're reviewing this while reading Gilgamesh, which is considered the first work in human history, the first written work in human history. And there is some arguing on whether or not it's an epic. So we're going to review these conventions so you guys can kind of think of that on your own. So there are epic conventions essentially and there are a few that should be found in every epic every epic would have these and then there are numbers that are not in every epic but consistently show up so one thing in all epics is the hero you know Captain America um, so the hero is a figure of great national or even cosmic importance he's usually the ideal man of his culture and I do say he because epics have traditionally been written um, with male heroes he is often uh, has superhuman or divine traits. He has an imposing physical stature and is greater in all ways than the common man. Now, hero in this instance doesn't necessarily mean what we consider hero now, which is a good person, Captain America. A uh, hero can also be someone we consider bad. For instance, in Paradise Lost by John Milton, the hero is Satan, so, um, you know, not the best role model in, in that situation. We have the setting, Asgard. Um, the setting is vast in scope. It is covers great geographical distances, perhaps even visiting the underworld, other worlds, other times. I think you're getting my, my hint here that the Marvel Universe, comics in general, very much follow the epic conventions. Uh, the action. Um, the action consists of deeds of valor or superhuman courage, especially in battle. No one can argue that Tony Stark sacrificing his life is not um, deeds of superhuman courage right there. The style of writing is elevated and even ceremonial at times, which is why when we read it, sometimes it's, it's a bit dry or difficult because it's not written in the way that they would normally speak or present at the time. There are supernatural forces um, and they typically interest themselves in the action and intervene at times to keep the story moving along or create conflict. Those are all things that should be found in any epic we reread. So while we're reading Gilgamesh, keep those conventions in mind and see if you can identify all of them as it as you read. Now, conventions found in some epics, or some of these are found in, in the various epics, are as follows. We have um, the epic typically begins by stating the theme of the epic. Oh, great muse, tell us a story of how Odysseus returned home after 20 years abroad. That's the whole point of it. Um, we have the writer invoking Calliope, which is one of the nine muses. Uh, so the muses are the daughters of Zeus and I can never pronounce her name, Menemsi, which is the Titan goddess of memory. The nine daughters each represent the different types of arts. You have Calliope, who's the muse of epic poetry, makes sense that they invoke her. Cleo, who is the muse of history. Erato, who's the muse of love poetry, which makes sense, Erato, erotic. Uh, Eutrepi, which is the muse of music, song, and lyric poetry. Mel Melpomini, which is a muse of tragedy. Polyhymnia, which is a muse of hymns. Tepsichore, which is a muse of dance. Thalia, the muse of comedy. And Urania, the muse of astronomy. A lot of mouthfuls there. The narrative of an epic will typically begin in media res, which is when our hero is at the lowest point of his story, and then earlier portions of how the hero got there appear as flashbacks throughout the epic. The categories and genealogies are all given, so we know that you know Gilgamesh is the son of Ninsun and this other king who's the son of, the son of, the son of, to add legitimacy to their heroic status. The main characters give extended and formal speeches. It's part of that elevated aspect to show how they're superior in all ways to others. And we have the use of Homeric epithets. So a Homeric epithet is the heavy use of repetition in stock phrases. The poet repeats these passages that consist of several lines in various sections of the poetry of the epic. Um, and this makes a poem easier to memorize. This is key because 
poems, the epic poems were were oral narratives initially that bards would go around from city to city, town to town, and tell the tale, and it was all from memory. It wasn't until they were written down that they became the stagnant pieces that we have now, and there is a debate among scholars about whether or not that essentially killed the story, because how would the heroes change based on what's going on in society and what society values at any given time. Um, go reread the Iliad. Achilles is not a good guy. Uh, yet he was revered back then as this amazing warrior. He's swift footed Achilles. Um, so it's just, it's interesting to think about how the evolution of that work died once it was written down. So uh, some examples of Homeric epithets. We have rosy fingered Dawn, swift footed Achilles, father of gods and men, master of bright lightning, mastermind of war, that kind of thing. And then we have the use of the Homeric simile um, or the epic simile. Um, this is a more involved ornate comparison and it's extended in great detail. So for example, if you go to the Iliad, book six lines 146 to 149, we have this Homeric simile. As is the generation of leaves, so is that of humanity. The wind scatters the leaves on the ground, but the live timber burgeons with leaves again in this season of spring returning. So one generation of men will grow while another dies. Very poetic to talk about the circle of life. And this concludes our presentation on Epic Conventions. I hope you enjoyed it. Make some notes, see how it approaches within the Epic of Gilgamesh. And if you catch anything that you want to bring up in an online discussion, please, by all means, do so.